Let's talk about microbiology in the context in which it developed. So microbiology is really kind of a new science. Biology itself is probably one of the first sciences, um, at least in as far as medicine has been around for a long time and People have been basically cutting other people up and being surprised at what they found inside of them. Um, but microbiology, in order for it to exist, you have to be able to see microbes. And microbes are essentially things that are too small to see with the naked eye. So microbiology cannot exist until there is a tool with which to see microbes. So, um, the science of microbiology was born in 1674 ish, depending upon exactly where you want to chase it to. Uh, there are two people who are generally credited with uh, being the ones to discover microbes um, there's Robert Hooke who was a famous polymath and scientist who did amazing work in physics, in chemistry, in biology, um, and used an early microscope uh, basically to discover cells. Um, and uh, he was not particularly looking at most microbial things. Um, he did describe uh, a common bread mold in 1665. Uh, and that was, was the first discovery of microbial cells. They were microbial cells that were living in a multicellular, non-microbial mold complex and the way he was looking at them didn't really give much um didn't really give much context other than the fact that they looked like little you know little things like this which is why he called them cells they looked like little cells to him uh yeah the First discovery of actual or first observation of actual microbes is typically credited to Anthony van Leeuwenhoek, a Dutch uh, fabric merchant. Not a scientist, right? I mean, there really weren't any scientists at the time there, but uh, wasn't even what, what would have been called a natural philosopher at the time. He was a drapery merchant guy. And uh, had, a ha had a hobby of making, grinding um, lenses. Didn't actually grind them. We'll get to that in a second. Um, so why would this fabric merchant be involved with, you know, making lenses and making microscopes? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Um, first, like, in order to, let's say you got a, a, a shipment of fabric coming in. You want to be able to look in real close and see, you know, all there, are there mold spores in the fabric? How close is the weave count actually? There were, were legitimate reasons why you might want to actually take an up-close look at some of this fabric. Um, but he also seems to have just really liked making microscopes. And uh, he did not invent the microscope. But he made the first really good microscopes. The first ones that had fairly powerful lenses. In fact, it was many, many years after his death, because he didn't tell anyone how he made the lenses. It was many years after his death before people were actually able to make lenses that were as good as the ones Lee Winhook made. And um, he, he actually didn't grind them, we now believe. He actually took molten glass and like dropped little drops of it off into water. And uh, when you have a liquid falling 
in free fall into water, it actually makes a perfect sphere. We think that that was actually how he got these really, really good lenses. We didn't tell anyone about how he did it. He wasn't a scientist. He wasn't devoted to like the greater understanding of human knowledge. He just wanted to make cool lenses. And for a while, he became like the talk of the town. He was like the the guy who you would invite to your parties because he had uh, he had made these relatively powerful microscopes and just like looked at whatever in it. And like he looked at pond water or lake water and he found that stuff that, you know, you thought was pure water that you drawn up from a well and you were going to drink. And then he looked at it and he saw that it was full of all these little squiggly things squirming around and swimming around and eating each other and doing all sorts of crazy stuff. And, um, and he called these animacules, right? Which basically means, you know, tiny animal particles. And, uh, he became the, the, the talk of the town for a while you would invite Lee Wood Hook to your party if you were like a big wig and like you would have him bring his microscope and he would like you know show everyone uh you know um uh, uh the wine he would he would put some of the wine under the microscope and you would all look into it and you would see all the little yeast particles you know floating around in there and you everyone would go ah! and the wine would you know, and they would go, oh, look, what's in the wine that we're eating? And they'd show people, like, ah, this is what's actually on, top, on on the food that you're eating here. And people would look at it and go, oh, gross. People, you know, things are a little swirling around on the uh, on the food, whatever. And so he was he was really, you know, became a, 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 a you know, kind of party trick uh, in that way. But he wasn't a scientist. Like, he, he had a little bit of that... Um, nature about him, but he didn't do any experiments. He didn't do anything with it. He just observed this stuff and he would like draw pictures of it and um, would describe very well what it was that he saw, but he didn't do any experiments. He didn't actually try to figure anything out. Um, so he was the one who discovered, hey, there are these, there's this whole microbial world, this whole microscopic world that is totally different than anything anyone's ever seen before. And the creatures that he observed like behaved kind of like animals. They would run around and eat each other, but they didn't look like anything anyone else had seen. There were these like, you know, blobs with little hairs coming out of them or like long, you know, blobby tentacles and stuff like that. Um, they didn't look like anything anyone else had seen. Now, um, we're going to need to go back, way back, even further than... Uh, you know, the, the, the Renaissance, we're going to go way back to ancient Greece. Um, and there had been, all the way from Aristotle, uh, there was a theory as to how life comes to be, right? And so, for the most part, uh, like, the Greeks were an agrarian people, it didn't surprise them that, you know, most things come from other living things, you know, that in order to get a baby sheep, you need a mommy sheep and a daddy sheep, and they share a special hug, um, and, uh, you know, sometime later, baby sheep comes around, like, they, they understood that, they understood that, like, humans come from other humans, and sheep come from other sheep, and that trees come from seeds, and stuff like that, all of that made perfect sense to them. But there was this whole other category of living things that they didn't necessarily see where did they come from, right? So like worms. Where do worms come from? Well, if you're just looking around, what you see is uh, like it rains and then there's a bunch of worms that come out of the ground. And like in places, trust me, in places where it rains, when it rains, you can like the worms will climb up out of the ground for some reason. Um, and so they had never seen a mommy worm and a daddy worm and a baby worm, right? Nobody ever seen two worms mating. Um, and so they go, all right, where are these worms coming from? Um, they also noticed that, like, you know, maggots would just appear on rotting meat. Um, that, uh, you know, things like frogs would just sort of show up in ponds and things like that. 
So there was this other category of things that they've never actually seen breeding, never seen any eggs or seeds or young ones. And so they thought, okay, well, it makes sense that these lesser creatures uh, probably just spontaneously generate due to uh, interactions of non-living things. Like they thought that, uh, you know, the interactions of the elements that like when the water from the rain comes in contact with the dirt from the earth, that this is they mix into mud and that this is what causes worms to arise. The worms just spontaneously generate in the mud. Or that when um, the vitality of the air is, contacts the, um, the, the odors and the miasma of the rotting meat, uh, this is what causes maggots to spontaneously generate on the meat. Right, so they they didn't they didn't see the the flies laying eggs. So they didn't necessarily assume that flies laid eggs. They just thought, well, you've got air and you've got meat, and they come together, and then boom, you get maggots, and then the maggots turn into flies. And this is called the theory of spontaneous generation, that some life can arise spontaneously from non-living matter. And this was like Aristotle came up with this idea. Everyone believed it because Aristotle said it uh, all the way down into, well, really down into um, the, the pre-modern era. Um, and this, uh, this theory had certain supporters and certain detractors. And we're going to talk about a few of them. Um, Specifically, Francisco Reddy, Louis Pasteur, and John Tyndall, and we're going to talk about how they um, used science and experimentation to kind of put the kibosh on this whole idea of spontaneous generation. So uh, let's start off looking at Francisco Reddy. So he uh, it was in the uh kind of pre microbiology era i guess it was around the time that microbiology was first being discovered it was in in 1668 this is about the same time that hook is discovering the existence of cells but uh you know news didn't get around that fast there wasn't the internet they might not have known each other uh but he um he took this idea that like say well maggots spontaneously generate from rotting meat. And he said, you know, I don't think they do. I think that maggots come from flies laying eggs that are too small for anyone to see. And so to prove this, he took two basically chambers and he put some meat in each of them. And, like, the first thing that he did was he just sealed up one of the chambers so that nothing could get in there. And he observed that the, um, the meat in the open chamber, it rotted and it got maggots on it. And um, the one in the sealed container didn't. Didn't particularly rot, didn't get any maggots on it and he says okay well look like if you, you you know in this case maggots don't spontaneously generate the spontaneous generation has huh, said, well of course not of course not we we never said that all that was required was meat I mean, obviously you've cut it off from the vital essence of the air by putting it in this closed container without the vital essence of the air naturally it's not going to uh, to, to spontaneously generate. You clearly don't understand the theory. And so he says, all right, we're going to do this experiment again. And this time he put one of the containers was covered with gauze. And so like the gauze would allow air to get through, but it would keep any flies out. And 
On the one that was open, the flies could get in and land on the meat. And sure enough, even though both were open to the air and both meats rotted, only the meat that the flies could actually land on got maggots on it. And he said, ah, you know, voila. So uh, the, the maggots don't spontaneously generate from the interaction of the meat and the air. They come from the flies. If you keep the flies off the meat, no maggots. And so this put the first nail in the coffin of spontaneous generation. But it still took another 200 years to put this theory to rest. Um, now, as I said, like shortly after this experiment, you get Leeuwenhoek and his animalcules and things like that. And so the spontaneous generation guy said like, well, okay, so maybe flies and worms are actually in the class of higher animals like sheep and humans. But clearly, certainly these animalcules that Mr. Leeuwenhoek has discovered, like you would, no one would ever think that they would reproduce like us. Right? They must surely be spontaneously generating. You can't imagine them laying eggs. So uh, then there was like, okay, we got to prove that these microbes aren't in fact just spontaneously generating. Um, now, there were a few people who contributed each way. So like one idea was, well, if these animalcules, if these microbes are only coming from other microbes, if you take broth and you boil it to kill all the microbes, then you shouldn't get any microbes arising. And so John Needham sort of gave some evidence to spontaneous generation by, say, by going, okay, we take broth and we boil it. So everything in it's dead. There's no microbes living in it. And we let it sit out, and we come back a few days later, boom, you still got microbes in it. And um, so then there was, okay, like, you know, some people said, ah, this proves spontaneous generation. And other people said, well, no, look, like what's happening is you just got the broth sitting out there on your table and you've got dust falling into it. The dust is carrying microbes in, and then those microbes are reproducing inside of the broth. It doesn't matter that you killed them all at the beginning if there's still plenty of microbes coming around getting inside of it. So you have uh, Spallanzani, who says, well, okay, let's take this thing. Let's take your experiment. We're going to boil the broth, and then we're going to seal the flask. So you have one broth. So let's go here. You're going to boil. And then another broth that you're going to boil. All right. And then after you get done boiling them, you're going to melt the flask shut for one of them. And you find that this one with the mat, with the flask melted shut, no microbes grow in it. You can let it sit for as long as you want. No microbes grow in it. This one that's still open, you get microbes growing. And so Spallanzani said, okay, well, like, Clearly what you have here is that microbes actually do come from other microbes. If you kill off all the microbes in the broth and then you prevent any new microbes to coming in, coming in by sealing the flask, you don't get any new microbes. And the spontaneous generation people said, well, obviously you don't get any microbes growing in that case because again, you have made the classic error. You have cut off the, the broth from the vital force of the air. And you can't get spontaneous generation without fresh air. We never said you couldn't get it without fresh air. So, you know, that was a problem then. Because how do you have something that's open to air but doesn't allow any dust to get in? Even, um, 
you know, the spontaneous generation guys went back and they did. They said, oh, but if we cover it with gauze, you'll see that microbes still grow on it. So we repeated Reddy's experiment and it didn't block it. But of course, gauze might block flies, but it doesn't block dust from getting in or things that are actually micro, uh, microscopic. So this controversy went on and on. Enter Louis Pasteur. You probably know about Louis Pasteur because he developed pasteurization. And pasteurization is important, don't get me wrong, but it is not the most important thing that Louis Pasteur did. Louis Pasteur is generally considered the father of modern microbiology. Now remember I, I said that um, Leeuwenhoek was the one who, who discovered microbiology, who basically you know, kind of founded the science, founded microbiology. But here I'm saying modern microbiology. Microbiology is a science. So Leeuwenhoek just looked at stuff and he said, ah, look, animalcules, isn't that cool? Louis Pasteur actually made this into a science. He's the one who actually did experiments and formulated the rules for how microbes work. Um, he demonstrated that the air is full of microorganisms, mostly clinging to little dust particles. Um, and uh, the first thing that he did was he did that same experiment that we just talked about, but instead of sealing the, um, the flask shut, he put a cotton plug in it. And he says, ah, well, if I put a cotton plug in it, it's not totally sealed shut but you don't get any growth. But you know, the, the, the spontaneous generation people, they didn't like that very much. They said that the cotton plug might be too restrictive, right? They didn't have free and open, clear contact with the air. So we came up with the second experiment. He designed this weird looking swan neck flask that you see down here, right? And here was his idea, right? So you take this weird swan neck flask and um, you boil it and kill off everything that's inside of it. And the way this flask works is any dust coming in is going to get stuck in this crook here, right? The dust settles out inside here. The dust can't really make a U-turn and go back upwards. But air can. So, like, there's an unobstructed air path. This broth has total and complete access to the air, but any dust is going to settle out here and get trapped. And he did this experiment and he found that if you take this swan neck flask and you boil the broth inside of it, you let it sit. You let it sit for years. And no microbes grow. In fact, in the Pasteur Museum in France, I believe that there are still a few... Uh, of his original flasks there, and they still have not grown any microbe hundreds of years later. So he says, okay, you can have broth, and you can have it have access to the air, but if, if it doesn't have, um, if the dust can't get to it, you don't get any microbes growing. So what's actually happening is dust is carrying microbes in, and then those microbes are reproducing. Spontaneous generation doesn't happen. And then he proved it even more by he took this, maybe somebody would have said that the, the broth was defective. So he took this, uh, the flask, tipped it, so that a little bit of broth came in contact with this area where all the dust had settled out, and then sloshed it back in. And in just a few hours, you got microbes growing in the broth. So he was able to show that it was microbes being carried in by the dust and that all of the microbes that they found growing in these broths came from other microbes that were introduced by dust. And nothing was being spontaneously generated. All of these microbes were coming from other microbes. And this did a pretty good job of convincing most people. But you don't ever, like, believe just one experiment. So a lot of people wanted to repeat Louis Pasteur's experiment. And there was a problem. Um, 
So now we'll get to Tyndall here. He was trying to reproduce Pasteur's experiment. And he found that it didn't always work. And a lot of people found that it didn't always work. Um, like a lot of the spontaneous generation people went and repeated uh, Pasteur's experiment. And they got, with their swan neck flasks, they boiled it for five minutes. And then they set it out and stuff grew. And they said, you're a fraud, Pasteur. Look, we did your same experiment. We made broth. We made your stupid-looking flasks. We boiled them. And then microbes still grow. So you did something wrong. Spontaneous generation is still happening. And this actually demonstrates one of the most important concepts in science, which is not just the importance of repeatability, but the importance of standardization. So, like, Pasteur was doing experiments in Paris and France. And what did broth mean back then? Broth meant whatever you made, like with the local broth recipe. You go to your broth person and they make you some broth out of whatever happens to be locally lying around. And so it's like France. They got, like, every village has five different types of cheese. So, yeah, like, broth just meant whatever local broth there was. And so in Paris... You know, Pasteur was making French Parisian broth, whereas, um, you know, somebody who's doing his experiments in a rural village might be making broth from hay uh, or something like that. And it turns out that not all microbes are exactly identical. There is a certain type of microbe that makes, uh, and this is going to be really important later on in the class, uh, but it makes uh, endospores. And endospores are these really, really tough, hard to destroy, um, like, like the basically the the bacteria kind of turtle up, and they get really, really tough, and um, and they can't be killed by boiling them for just five minutes. So the way Louis Pasteur was making his broth was different from the way everyone else was making their broth, and they were using different sources. And so Louis Pasteur's broth didn't have endospores in it because they just weren't found in the stuff he was making his broth from. But some people were making their broth from stuff that had endospores in it, and you can't kill endospores by just a quick five-minute boil. And it was Tyndall who realized that, actually, if everyone makes their broth the way Pasteur made his broth, everything works out. If you make your broth the same way he made his broth, then you get the same results he did. And that if you make broth that comes from endospores, or that has endospores in it, or that he didn't know about endospores, but uh, if you had a uh, broth that contained hay in it, hay was discovered to be the source of the, um, the contaminant microbes, it would work fine. You just had to boil it for five hours instead of five minutes. And that uh, if you standardize the way the experiments are done, then you don't have any problems with, uh, with repeatability. And so this is why, like, in your lab, you're going to be working with a lot of different standardized broths. Like, you're probably going to be using um, uh, TSB and TSA uh, next week. In, in your first week of lab classes, and that stands for triptych soy broth. Um, sometimes you'll use nutrient broth or Luria Bertani broth. These are all standard ways of making broth that have very specific nutrient contents, and everything comes from the same source. We don't just now go out and make whatever broth we want is really important that when you do your experiments, in order to get the same results that you expect to get, you have to be actually using standardized materials. And it was later the same year, uh, 1876, in uh, Germany, that an independent experimenter, uh, Ferdinand Kohn, uh, discovered endospores. And these endospores, he was able to prove, uh, were capable of turning into this heat-resistant hard form, and that that 
explain the discrepancy in the results. Uh, and he was able to find that most soils, like dirt, was a good source of endospore. So if you're making your, um, your broth in like from hay or something that's got a lot of dirt in it, then you're gonna get endospores in it. Or if you're making your broth from something else, then you might not get endospores in it. You know, Pasteur made his broth with sugar and yeast extract, um, which didn't have any dirt in it, so it worked fine. Uh, but like other people that might use hay infusions or that were just working in an area that had like, maybe you've got your lab set up in a stable or something like that, it just wasn't a very clean environment. Um, then if you get into sport contamination, you gotta boil it for a whole lot longer to get the same results. Once we, so uh, these experiments of past yours really, once all of the um, standardization, everything like that was explained, we're able to truly show that spontaneous generation wasn't happening, didn't happen, doesn't happen. That all life, even microbial life, comes from other life. And this showed the universality of life. And shortly thereafter, I mean, Pasteur didn't do, just do this one thing. He did a whole ton of other things as well. Like, he invented the process of pasteurization. He also made the first vaccines and did, and really formulated microbiology as a science. Um, and uh, another researcher, um, Koch, who was uh, researching at the same time, and is sometimes considered the father of medical microbiology, the results of their experiments together basically showed that microbes come from other microbes, all life comes from other life, and that diseases are caused by microorganisms. Now, it turns out that there are actually lots of diseases that might not be caused by microorganisms, but they together, or, you know, the culmination of their work was to set out what's called the germ theory of disease. And once we had this idea that actually diseases were caused by microbes, people just went and looked for the microbes that caused diseases and actually very quickly started finding them. Most pathogenic bacteria were discovered and identified by 1918. Um, interestingly, it wasn't until about 1918 that most doctors started accepting that like maybe disease was caused by microbes and started like washing their hands and not like packing dirt into people's wounds and stuff like that. Um, once we had a good understanding of the various diseases that could be caused by microbes, started to figure out what viruses were and that took a whole lot longer, um, then there were huge, huge improvements in human health. And you started seeing um, we entered into the golden age of microbiology, where we started developing antibiotics to treat infectious disease. We understood vaccination and how to use the human immune system to prevent uh, disease in the first place. And we also understood how to structure our environments through sanitation in order to prevent the spread of disease from person to person. And these three inventions have saved more human lives than any other thing. Like, just... Totally. Probably more have saved more human lives than all other things put together when you get right down to it. All right. So that is the history of microbiology in a nutshell.